Now, I hate to sound like one of those TV infomercials, but do you ever get tired of cranking the handbill on your milling machine? Maybe you can't handle it. Or maybe it makes you a little bit cranky. Well, you're not alone in this regard. You know, small amounts of travel on the table isn't too bad. I mean, that's the fun of manual machining. But going from one end of the table to the other can be a real pain, especially if you need to do it multiple times in one operation. And it's for that reason why people add power feeds to their mills. They're just motors with a clutch and gearbox, and they'll do all of the heavy work for you. Or I guess all of the boring work. Although it shouldn't be confused with this type of boring work, which is a lot of fun to do. However, one thing I can't understand is just why they're so expensive. I mean, the good quality ones for proper milling machines are expensive for a reason. If you see a teardown, there's quite a lot that goes into making them work. But for the one that's specifically made for my mill, you know, they want close to 600 bucks for one, and I just can't see why. I've seen a teardown for one, and they're pretty basic, so I don't know why they're charging that much for it. And you know, for what it's worth, I've heard that this specific one isn't all that great. And I guess that brings us here. The goal of the video is to make one myself, hopefully cheaper and a lot better than the one that's sold for this milling machine. So the first thing I did was I jumped on eBay and I bought one of those geared DC motors. It's 24 volts, 45 watts, and it maxes out at roughly 250 RPM. It probably doesn't seem like too much, but the worm drive gearbox will give us more than enough torque for the job. The cost for this was about 90, 100 bucks. I know some people choose to use stepper motors, or I guess servo motors for this job, and I guess there are advantages to using them, but for simplicity's sake, I think a DC motor will be more than enough for this job. What we need now though, is a way to connect the motor to the lead screw of the table. Now the lead screw thankfully is designed for a power feed and has a slot in the end that allows it to be driven. And that end is all housed and supported by this end plate. And if possible, I'd like to incorporate the end plate into the design rather than having to go ahead and remake it. As you can probably see, there's a bronze bushing and some oilers and it's going to be a lot easier if I can just reuse it. So the first thing we need to do is make a driving pin or a driving lug to drive the lead screw. And thankfully, I had already made one of those a few months ago. The driving lug will sit on the front side and it will slot into position. And to make it all captive, I'll make up an end cover plate. And a piece of 12mm plate should do the job. Now before I machine it, I'll get the end plate in the milling machine and I'll locate the centre of the bushing. I'll then drill and tap four holes for the cover plate to bolt onto. With that done, I can get the cover plate in the milling machine and cleaned up. I can then drill and bore a hole where the centre bushing is located. And if possible, I'd like a pretty good fit on the lug. However, I do want to be careful not to over constrain the whole assembly to cause binding, and that's going to be a big theme in this project. I'll then use the DRO to help me drill a three hole pattern on the plate and that's going to match up with the three mounting holes on the gearbox. 
I'll then drill the holes for the bolts. And finally, I'll drill two shallow holes for the pins to locate into. If you didn't already notice before, there's two pins on the end plate that are proud of the surface, and they will locate into the holes. And thankfully, the cover plate goes on quite well. Next, we need a way to hold the motor in place. And I think the easiest, most simple way was to make three rods which are the same length. And once it's all together, I'm pretty happy with that. It's pretty solid too, which is what you'd want it to be. Now as you probably noticed, there is a gap between the motor and the lug, and that's going to be for our clutch mechanism. We obviously need a way to disengage the motor when we aren't using it, otherwise we wouldn't be able to turn the hand wheel, owing to the worm wheel in the gearbox. Worm gears are pretty good at preventing any unwanted movement, so that would pretty much lock up the table. Now my original plan was to simply use gears to engage and disengage the feed, much like the design in the power feed in my lathe. However, that design proved to be quite bulky and just unnecessarily complicated for what it was. Instead, I'm simply going to rely on spline shafts and spline sleeves to act as my clutch, although it is going to rely on perfect alignment, otherwise the design will become overconstrained and cause unnecessary wear to the gearbox. So first, I need to make up a spline, which I can make using the dividing head and the milling machine. This one here specifically is a straight sided spline with six sides. And that's our spline shaft for the motor end. What I will need to do though is get a 3mm key cut in it. I'm not sure if you saw it earlier, but the gearbox does have a 3mm wood drift key, and that's going to be to drive, well, whatever you're attaching it to. 
And that's about as good as a fit as I can ask for. The driving lug will also need a matching spline shaft and they'll both need to be key to fit each other. Now to connect the two together, I will need to make up a matching spline sleeve, which I can do by manually broaching it. The keyway bushing has an offset key, and that allows me to index the part and cut the spline pattern. Alright, so we have the spline sleeve made up and it's now in the assembly. Now the reason why I went with the spline is because we're very easily able to move the spline sleeve under load. Plus I thought it would make for a very interesting part. I've got it hooked up to 12 volt power, so nothing else left to do but see how it goes. So there's definitely more run out than I was hoping for, at least in the spline sleeve, but thankfully the engagement between the two is quite smooth. Obviously there's no load, but so far I'm pretty happy with it. The only thing I will need to do though is break out the old four-jaw chuck and chew up the spline sleeve. If that doesn't work, I'll switch over to a more conventional clutch design. So whilst that gets done, I'll start to machine up the selector fork for engaging and disengaging the gearbox. All this really does is move the spline sleeve and hold it in position. So for my design, the selector is going to ride on the rods that connect the motor to the cover plate. Now the design calls for a cutout with a small, I guess a rib in the middle, that's going to connect to the sleeve. And to make it, I'm simply going to use the boring head and plunge down progressively, and that'll form the part. And with the first side now done, I'll flip it and do the other side. With the fork now made, I need a way to keep it fixed in place when the clutch is engaged and disengaged. And I think a simple ball detent should do the job. Although, I don't have any ball bearings on hand. <laughs> 
So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and cut up an old ball bearing that's, I think it's from the lathe, and it's completely worn out. One hundred percent not a hoarder. See, there's definitely a reason why I keep these old ball bearings on hand. Now the balls are seven mil in diameter, so I'll make the whole seven mil and I'll tap them for M8. I'll then cut a slot into the sleeve, which thankfully doesn't need to be too concentric. And so far, the selector seems to work quite effectively. I'll then mark out the engaged and disengaged positions and then turn down some gutters for the ball bearings to lock into. The balls will then get a spring to add a bit of load to them. And thankfully the action is quite smooth and they lock very nicely into position. Now to prevent me from pushing the selector rings too far back, I'm going to glue these stop rings in place. The front of the selector will also get two stop pins and that will stop me from pushing it too far forward. I'll also need a knob to allow me to use it. So with it all assembled, let's do a quick test. Now we still have a small amount of run out in the spline sleeve, but it's a lot better than it was beforehand. Thankfully though, this isn't causing us any issues. If there is any misalignment issues, it's always quite obvious on the power supply. Even a small amount of misalignment, which causes binding, is going to show up as a spike in current, and that's what was happening here. But thankfully, a small amount of tapping on the rods brought everything into alignment, and the current is steady. So at this point, I'm pretty happy to stick with this type of spline connection, which is a big relief because I didn't want all of this work to go to waste. So with the power feed now done, all I need to do now is make a cover and a power switch. So I currently have a 24 volt power brick on order, but for testing it, I am going to be using one of those closed frame power supplies. I've also got an eBay and I've bought one of those DC motor PWM boards. The motor is low power, so it should be okay with this one, and this one here was roughly 10 bucks. With this board I can do speed and direction, which is really all I need. I've also picked up some micro switches to act as limit switches. This way I don't accidentally run out of travel on the table and break something. Most likely something in the gearbox. I'm sure there's other, more better ways of doing this. But the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to wire the limit switches in series in the same circuit as the DC motor. 
Now the switches are normally closed, which allows current to pass through to the motor, but once it gets pressed, it's going to open the circuit and cut the power. It's pretty simple, yet effective. I just need to find a way to mount the switches. I also need to construct a basic cover to shield the spline shaft from the chips and dust. And I think a simple sheet metal cover will do the job. I'll also make cutouts for the switches and a slot for the handle. Alright, so that is pretty much the power feed done. All in all, I'm pretty happy with it. Definitely took a little bit longer to make than I thought, but in terms of dollars spent, we're about three or four hundred dollars better off than if I'd bought the Sieg brand one. That is unless you count the fly press, which I built with this project in mind. And if you count that, well, then we're thousands of dollars in the red. But hey, that's not really the point of hobby machining, is it? And I don't know about you, but I really love that satisfying click as the clutch engages. Overall, great stuff. I'll definitely keep an eye on the spline just to make sure nothing's binding, but so far it's very smooth, which should be very good news for the long term. The final thing I will do is 3D print a cover for the motor and the PCB, but I'll have to do that once I get my hands on a suitable FDM 3D printer. And by the time you're watching this, the power brick should have arrived to replace the open frame power supply. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.